Good morning, everyone. Let's stand. My name's Tyler. I'm grateful to be here with you. We sing of Jesus today.
we stop a moment and we sing that, do you really know that? Do you believe that today? That, oh, believer, you are a child of the King of the Most High. This is what God's Word says. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Daddy, Father. First Peter, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of the darkness and into His marvelous light. I hope we can celebrate that today. The enemy may be against you, others may be against you, but this is what the Lord has said. Chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. We declare. Spin 
sons and daughters. Holy Spirit, would you, in these beautiful moments of gathering, would you speak to us, continue to speak to us. May we walk and know that deeply. God, thank you for your word today. And as we open it and we participate in it, we literally hopefully eat it and take it in. I pray that it would be received deeply and planted, that it would change us. We recognize that your word is power, and so may it come now and change us deeply. God, you are worthy of a million songs, of a million voices. Thank you for these moments. We sing and we speak and we pray only in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can have a seat. Good morning, church. Buenos dias. We're so happy you decided to come worship the Lord Jesus Christ this morning with us. My name is Cheyenne Solis. I'm part of the staff here with the missions team. If you're visiting us for the first time, take a few minutes to just fill out one of these Start Here cards and drop off in one of the baskets or on your way out, give to one of the ushers. This, uh, this end of the month on the 28th to the 30th, we have our Love and, marriage, love and War Marriage Retreat. If you are interested in being part of that, please sign up online. We also are going to start our baptism classes. Um, if you want to be a part of that, do so by signing up online as well. Many of you have heard about the race for the reason that's coming up in next month on the 21st. If you haven't had a chance to get ready and start preparing yourself to run, you still have a chance to sign up online. That's the 1K, the 5K, and the 10K. How many of you guys are going to run this year? Or walk. All right, a few. So we're looking for folks that would want to also serve, volunteer, and helping us have all the water, the games, the food, the snacks, everything ready. And I want to challenge you. We're looking for 90 people to sign up. Before the end of this Sunday, we need 90 people to sign up and help us for this event. This next week, we have our Go Be Adventure Informational Week. This summer, some of you decided to join us in going out on an adventure and sharing the love of Christ, whether it was Toronto, San Francisco, or any other part of the world, Fiji, Guatemala. We still have a couple of trips left, 2018. So if you're interested in finding out what's taking place with our Gobi Adventures, come next week, high noon, we'll be having that here. Also on the 26th, we'll have a lunch with Sam Arthur. Sam Arthur is from India, one of our big partners, Mission India. He will come and share all about church planting, adult literacy, and the children's kids clubs that are taking place in India. If you want to know about that, we have free food as well. And following that, on the 27th, we have His Voice Global Dinner. Again, we'll have free food. And if you want to know what your dollars are doing across the world, please come and join us. And you can register online. We have so many activities taking place. Some of our missionaries, the wall that you see of pictures of folks out there, 
Well, they're back. They're here on their furlough, on their stateside assignment. If you see people out there, come and get to meet them and greet with them. I would encourage you to do that as well. Let's welcome Patrick as he continues his crossover series. Thanks, Cheyenne. Thanks. I, uh, I hesitate to tell you what I'm, think, what I'm laughing about, but um, I was like, I wanted to come up and ask Cheyenne to, uh, to say to you all, say hello to my little friend. <laughs> Some of you are like, what's that from? Don't worry, <laughs> but uh, I love his accent. Say hello to my little friend. So uh, anyways, hey, if you... Uh, I'm in a, such a good mood today, so it could go bad. If, um, if you need a note sheet, uh, would you raise your hand and our, our usher team will uh, get one of those in your hand so that you can follow along with us. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We did it in the first hour. We succeeded, and so we're going to try to do it again in hour two. <clears throat> uh, also, good morning to Odessa. Great to be with you. Looking forward to being with you the first Sunday in October, <clears throat> and I'll be... Uh, my goodness, <clears throat> we'll go get a drink. So the first Sunday of October, I'll be in Odessa. We also have an element service there. And let me also encourage you, um, I will not be here next week because of a previous speaking engagement that I've, I've scheduled for um, an organization out of the University of Arkansas, and <clears throat> which I know it's weak, but... Uh, uh, so I'll be gone speaking there, and then I'm out the next week for a speaking engagement. But please, please, please um, make it a priority to come next week and the week after. The reason I'm begging you to come is uh, one of our elders, Larry Gilbert, who has been with us since day one, is going to be speaking to you. And I, I kind of liken it to um, Uncle Larry is going to come talk to you, Okay. And, and he needs to speak to you. He has a message for you about who we are and who we're going to continue to be in my absence. And so um, please, please come listen to Uncle Larry the Elder. And um, it has been fun. No, it's not been fun. It's actually been maddening to, uh, to live around here and hear all the things that I'm going to be doing once I'm done here. Um, it's been quite exciting. Apparently, I'm running for governor, and, um, and uh, I'm, I'm running for every Senate seat in Texas, that, all two. And um, let's see, this week I heard that I was buying and selling apartment complexes. Yeah, I mean, someone said, hey, I heard you're going to go into the apartment business. And I was like, what, are you, what in the world? So well, you need to get a life, you people, whatever it is that's <laughs> causing you to sit around and figure out uh, what I'm doing. My wife and I are doing, we don't have a job, and we're going to see what God's going to do. So I'm trusting you have the note sheet in front of you, and let me just tell you, we're going to go full throttle, okay, and I'm not going to spend the same amount of time, actually, I'm not going to spend any time that I spent last week giving you just tons of scripture, okay? So if you're new with us, if this is your first week, and, and you see me sort of get going here, and you think, well, he hasn't read the Bible yet. This is week two, and last week was quite a setup with just, in fact, we only got through one and two last week because we read so much scripture. I don't feel like I need to defend myself to you, but I just, I know how you church people are, and so I want to make sure, and I'll show you some scripture, some more scripture as we go through the day together, but um, just want to, that little caveat. Now, remember what a giant is. A giant is any person, place, or thing that keeps me from winning. And, and remember, I told you last week, winning for me is shorthand for the phrase we've used around here for almost two decades now. Winning is becoming everything God has designed, called, and gifted me to be. We believe throughout God's scripture that we see God designed us on purpose. He's called us to a meaning, a life of great meaning, great purpose, and great competence, and security, and identity, and belonging. And so that design and that call comes with giftings as well. And with giftings, I mean not only spiritual gifts, but talents, okay? And, and I believe all of us have spiritual gifts. I, I will tell you that if you're new around here, I am not a firm believer that you get a spiritual gift at one point in your life and it's the only gift you have. 
through the rest of your life. I think we receive spiritual gifts as the Holy Spirit decides for the blessing of the body, as Paul talks about. And I also believe that spiritual gifts are that which are given to you outside of your natural ability and talents that cause you to have to depend upon God. In other words, let me, let me give you an example. I do not believe I have a spiritual gift of speaking and teaching, okay? That's a talent. What I have to have is the spiritual gift of love and grace and mercy or my talent is abused. Do you follow what I just said? See, some of you are afraid of your talents that God has given you, and you shouldn't be. But more often than not, God will equip you with a spiritual gift that is somewhat contrary to the power of your talent in order to keep you humble and dependent and serve people. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Because in the church, most people use a spiritual gift as an excuse to not do what they want to do in order to do what they decide they have to do or something like that. So just, anyways, I, I shouldn't even talk about that. That's, that's, we don't have time for that. So here we go. Number one and number two should be filled in for you. So just remember, giants are any person, place, or thing that keep you from winning. And, and I hope winning is not one of those terms that you equate with something un, unchurch. I mean, Psalm 118, verse 25, that says, Oh, Lord, our God, please give us success. And I'm not talking about, well, I, I got to keep squirrels. So number three, number three, since you already have one and two, here's number three. Intimidation, apparent momentum and power, past failure, and foregone conclusions are the operational strategy of giants. You can see it on the screen behind me on all of our campuses. So the giants of your life are really good at intimidating. They apparently have momentum and power. They feast on our past failures and foregone conclusions, and it's the strategy they use. In other words, the giants of your life know the song to sing and the chant to repeat that keeps you believing they're the winner and you're the loser. It's the still small voice or the ringing sound in your head that constantly reminds you you're a failure. It's, it's the voice of the church that's supposed to be the place of freedom from your past. It's the voice of the pastor and the elder or the deacon who never will let you forget your mistake, but want to remind you that they're better than you because they didn't have the same mistake you did. It, it's, it's the voice that has a familiar tone of a relative who never would deal with their giant but want to pass their giant on to you. It's the prancing sound at night when you lay your head down and you just hope you can have a night of peace and you hear the ringing again that says, this is you, by the way, this is you. It's, it's the chant that you and I know so well when the Bible says not to be entangled by the sin that so easily wraps us up and trips us up. And all of us, every soul in this room, know what it is to be easily tripped up. Even when you think you've whipped it, you can still trip up like that. And it's that voice of the giant walking through the valley of your soul saying, fee fi fo fum I smell who you are. And I want to remind you of it. And you need to hear the Spirit of God reminding you that voice is a liar. That voice does not hold the power that the Spirit of God holds within you to win the battle against the giant. In fact, I would tell you that if you are encountering, encountering giants in your life, that God has ordained for that giant to march through the valley of your life because the next generation depends on you finally standing up and slaughtering that giant. But just remember, those giants know how to scare you. That's why we don't deal with them. They're loud, even though they're just in our head. They're huge, even though they're just in our hearts. They're invisible, even though they seem so visible in the life we're living. These giants that we have to slaughter. And, and one more thing. You may be tempted to think your giant is not that significant. That's another trick of the giants, by the way. Don't worry about me, I'm just over here. But it keeps tripping you up, and it keeps tripping you up. I wrote in my notes... Giants always victory march and chant well-rehearsed defeat songs in my head. And you know what they look like, and you know what they sound like. They know, what the, they know what's in the junk drawer of your life. You follow what I'm talking about? As my good friend told me years ago, I was reading through all my journals over the last two decades, and it was in 2003 when he told me, he said, you know, Peyton, everybody's got a junk drawer. Isn't that right? 
Isn't that right? Some of you are like, don't look at me. It's like, I got a whole kitchen full of junk drawers. You know what I'm talking about? And, and so, um, and you can't just redecorate around them. You got it? Do you understand the point I just said? Odessa, what camera are you on? There you are. Just understand. You, you know what it sounds like. Do you all know what I'm talking about? The giant, what that giant sounds like and what that movie reel sounds like. You got it? You good? Can I move on? All right. What is this? Number four? Okay. The necessary preparation and resolve of a giant killer is forged in the quiet seclusion and growth of the inner person. The necessary preparation and resolve of a giant killer is forged in the quiet seclusion and growth of the inner person. I'm going to give you a bunch of scripture, okay? You, you probably don't have room on the front. You can flip your page over and write these down. I'm literally going to give you like seven or eight scriptures to just write down. We're not going to look them up, okay? And I'll tell you what I mean by this. So 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. Also in 1 Samuel, just write 1 Sam 2, 9. And then also in 1 Sam chapter 16, verse 18. And we'll come back to that. We're actually going to look that one up a little bit later on. So 1 Samuel 2, 9 and 16, 18. And if writing down scripture verses is new to you, just write down what you understand. There's no right or wrong way to write these down. Just write down what's going to help you remember. The next one is Zechariah. It's near the back of the Old Testament. Just write Zach, even though in the Old Testament it's spelled Z-E-C-H, so it sounds like Zeke. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. It says this, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You might want to put in your head or write in your notes, 2 Corinthians, so write 2 Cor, 2 C-O-R, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 5. So just remember, 1, 2, 1, 2, 2, 5, 5. Got that? Um, so 1, 2, 1, 2, 2, 5, 5, which tells you that when you received Jesus as Savior, he put his spirit inside of you, sealed you up. So the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, Romans chapter 8, lives in you to kill giants. You better meditate on that truth. That means you got the nuclear weapon of giant killer inside of you, Okay. So let me give you another one. Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8. It's a beautiful psalm that David is, is rehearsing how beautiful the heavens are and that God would consider him, which is where God is molding in him the inner person. Uh, let's see. I'll give you two more. Acts chapter 7. So New Testament, Acts chapter 7, verse 29 and 30. So Acts 7, 29 and 30. I know it's a lot, but hopefully you can, you'll doubt what I'm saying and you'll go check it. Galatians chapter 1, so Gal 1, verse 18. Let me tell you why Acts and Galatians are so important. In Acts and Galatians, it tells you the story of how God took Moses out of Egypt and secluded him in the desert for 40 years, it actually, a third of his life, God secluded him. In Galatians chapter 1, the apostle Paul tells us that for three years he went up north, basically, because the church wouldn't accept him. Paul. They were afraid of him. And the reason those verses are so important, and we'll see a little bit later on in the life of David, David became a giant killer in the seclusion of being a shepherd when nobody was watching. But all of these men, and you see this in the lives of men and women throughout the scriptures, God secludes them. So that in this quiet seclusion, God begins to grow the heart of a giant killer. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I, I love it when I tell people things and they don't believe me. And then they're reading someday. Like I had a young man send me an email the other day. And he said, hey, listen to this quote that I found. And it was from an old dead guy from back in the 1800s who said that God oftentimes secludes his saints. But you know what it's like as a parent. Like if you say something, your kids are like, you're stupid. But if somebody, along, somebody else says it, they're, you're, they're smart. You know what I'm talking about, parents? You know what I'm talking about? Anyways, so God will seclude you in order to grow you to be a slaughterer of giants. And he isolates you. In fact, I would tell you this. You're not ready to slaughter giants until you come to a place in your heart where you are content with nothing else except you and Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this. If you love husbands or wives or children or families or houses or anything you have 
more than me, then you're not worthy to walk with me. That means you got to love Jesus more than you love your spouse. That means you got to love Jesus more than you love your kids. And the reality is the more you love Jesus, the more he changes you and the better your love is for your spouse and your kids and those around you. That's the reality. Because he grows this love inside of you. Now, turn in your Bibles. Let me show you this one last scripture before we move on to number five. Psalm 131. I want you to look at the heart of someone who has been preparing to be a giant killer in quiet seclusion. Psalm 131. So it's almost in the middle of the Bible. Or look it up on your digital device. Psalm 131. It's a three-verse chapter. Three-verse chapter. Psalm 131. I'm looking it up with you. Psalm 131. It actually says that David was the writer of this psalm. And it, it, it's a, it tells you it's a song of ascent, which means it's a song of going up and recognizing the greatness of God. Listen to what David says. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. It literally means there's no anxiety. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. It means I'm not going to worry. Listen to this. I know it's kind of, some of you might be like eighth graders and giggle about this, but verse number two, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. In other words, when God begins to change and nurture in quiet seclusion the heart of a giant killer, they go from one phase of life to the next because God's growing them, but they do not fret and they do not worry because their soul has been nurtured and they are calm. Number five, number five, the necessary preparation and resolve of giant killers is forged in the consistent discipline of unseen everyday battles. Unseen everyday battles. Now this one, we're going to look up some scripture on this one, okay? So go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, Old Testament, 1 Sam chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I hope you look it up. Don't just stare at me. Like look down and act like you're looking at a Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let me bring you up to speed. Because remember what we're talking about. How does God create the heart of a giant killer? David, the most well-known, although not the first. So Saul is the king. Okay, it's King Saul. And Saul, if you want to read a verse in the Bible that will really mess your theology up, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14 says, The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Hmm. That's a whole other month of Sundays I don't have. And so what they say is, let's go find somebody who can play really nice music because music calms the savage beast. Okay? And they don't say it in the Bible, but you know what? That's what I mean. So they go looking for a dude who can play music that'll soothe David. And this is a passage I preach to the seniors almost the entire year that I'm with him. But 1 Samuel chapter 16, look at verse 18 in the description of David. Remember, God is preparing you and forging in you a giant killer attitude in the quiet seclusion and growth of the inner person and in the consistent discipline of unseen everyday battles. Young people in your 20s and 30s, possibly if you still think you're young in your 40s and 50s, and you wonder why nobody thinks you're as important as you think you are, it's because you're not fighting battles and winning them in the unseen places and you're wanting people to pay attention to you and the Lord is telling you you're not worthy of being paid attention to yet. And watch what happens in the life of David, okay? Verse 18, one of the young men answered, so they find this David guy and he's answering who he is. He says, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. And what he's talking about is, who he's talking about is David. Listen to the description. He is skillful in playing the harp. And if it helps you, say the guitar, okay? Because I know with the harp thing, you know, it's, it, it's not exactly a warrior thing. But, it, you know, back then it was. So he's skillful in playing. He's a man of valor. The word valor, and I wrote it in my Bible so it's always with me, means a man of strength, a man of capability, a man of skill, and even a man of wealth. So he's a man of valor. He's a man of war, which means he knew how to fight. He's prudent in speech, well-spoken, uses words well. And then it says, 
and he is a man of good presence. Now that phrase is made up of a Hebrew word that's used to describe Adam in Genesis 1 and 2. And it's this Hebrew word, ish, okay? Eve is the word isha, all right? And what it means is this, when it's used in the description of a man, it means when that cat walks into the room, he takes over. Everybody knows. Now let me ask you a question. Up until this point, what had David been doing for a living? That's right, shepherd, the middle knew. He'd been a shepherd, and he honed the character of a giant killer watching dirty, nasty sheep where no one was watching and no one was paying attention except God the Father. And in quiet seclusion, taking care of business, taking care of business, that'll be stuck in your head all day. And so in the quiet of taking care of sheep that weren't even his, he was hired to take care of people's sheep. Underneath the stars, that's why I gave you Psalm chapter 8. A warrior was fashioned. And if you would like to use this phrase, he paid his dues in spiritual privacy in order to prepare him for public whippings of giants. So you're not just going to walk out of here and be a, a giant killer until you walk into the seclusion of trusting God and letting him forge in you the battle that people do not see the unseen wars that you have to fight within you so that you can then be a victor in public. You fight these battles in private, and then God puts you in public. And I will tell you this, just a little side note. As you begin to fight these battles in private, and you begin to work for the Lord and not for men, that's half the problem as well. We're out there working, hoping the world pays attention to us rather than really trusting that if I'm working and no one is watching, but the one who is watching, he will put me where I need to be when I need to be there. And that's how you forge in your life this idea of being a giant killer. So you've got to work in private. You've got to let the Lord work in you in private. And let's go to the next thing, number six. A giant killer's future success is forged in the constant discipline and wisdom of learning to see the bigger picture. Learning to see the bigger picture. Now, if you have your Bibles open still and you didn't shut them down, go to chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. Chapter 17. So in chapter 17, this is the part where David shows up and... and um, and Goliath's marching around, you know, intimidating all the armies of Israel. He's marching around in the valley, and he's saying, somebody come fight me. And you, you probably know a little bit of the story. It's the same thing with Caleb. When Caleb kills the giants, he's just got this warrior's heart. And, and so David shows up, and I'm just going to read it to you. Go, go to verse 26. Uh, let's see, 1 Samuel 17. I don't know if I want to go to 26. Um, yeah, go to verse 26. So David says to the men who were standing around, remember the armies of the Israelites are standing, cowering at the giant, okay? And, and David says to the men who stood by, what, what's going to be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? See the bigger picture? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See the bigger picture? He doesn't just see the surface fight. He sees something bigger going on here. And then if you work your way down, let me just take you to... Um, um, let's go to verse 33. So it gets to Saul that David's going to go fight the giant. And Saul's like, really? So verse 33, Saul says to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him because you're just a kid. You're just a kid. By the way, that's another song of the, of the giants in your life who say you're just a kid, who say your grandfather couldn't handle this, neither, can, neither did your dad, and you can't either. It's, it's the, the giant who says, your great-great-grandmother had this problem, then your grandmother had it, and then your mother had it, and you're going to have it too. It's just in your family. It's, it's, the, it's this song that says, no matter who you are, what you become, how small you are, large you are, young you are, old you are, you're not going to be able to beat it. And, and even people around you say this stuff. So he says in verse 33, you can't do this. This man's been a man of war from his youth. Now listen to what David says, and go along with me on this, okay? Are you ready to go along with me, Odessa? Play the game. Okay, you be ready because you're like, what game? How many of you? 
I, I hate games. Like when you go to parties and people are like, let's play Monopoly. Does anybody like Monopoly? That is the world's longest game. So anyways, verse 34, David says to Saul, all right, your servant, that's David, I used to keep sheep for my father. And when there would come a lion, a tiger, or bear, oh, good, good, okay. I know it's not in there, but I just, just play the game. When there would come a lion, or tiger, or bear, and took a lamb from the flock. Now listen to David, harp playing David. Spoke well, entered a room, took it over. I would go after the lion, the tiger, or bear, and I, come on, and I would strike him, and literally he's saying I would take the lamb out of the mouth. And if he arose against me, so get the picture, he's saying to Saul, I would go after the lamb in the mouth of the lion, the tiger, or bear, and I would take the lamb out, and then sometimes the lion or tiger or bear would turn around and come after me. Listen to what he says. I'd catch him by the beard. I'd just grab him by the beard. That's how I was just, I'd just grab him, man, and I'd strike him and I'd kill him. Your servant has struck down lions and tigers and bears, and this uncircumcised cat will be just like one of them. Look at the bigger picture, because he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, now listen to what I just told you about private victories and disciplines and practices in private. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, the tiger, and the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. And Saul said, you go, bro. Lord be with you. <laughs> so I'm not making any of this up. Even Caleb, who waited for 45 years, was ready to pick a fight because of private victory and consistent discipline and a bigger picture. You see, forged in privacy and forged in seclusion and forged where no one was watching, watching was the warrior heart, not of someone who had not won victories, but someone who had been winning private battles. And in view of the bigger picture, the kid steps up and says, I ain't afraid to fight. I'm ready for the game. And some of you, God is screaming at you. I'm calling you to fight the fight. Your family wouldn't. And you're thinking, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And he says, be faithful today and keep fighting this fight. Fight in the word. Fight in prayer. Fight in service. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Because I am preparing you why no one's watching and no one's paying attention that you will change the legacy of your family. And that maybe, just maybe, you will have the blessing of sitting next to your dearly loved wife, men, and she will look over at you as mine did this weekend. For the, she's never said this to me, not because she hasn't thought of it, but she looked over and she said, I want to remind you, it is safe to say you have flipped the legacy of your family. You are the one in seclusion that God is calling out to slaughter the giant. Ladies, you are the one God is calling out to slaughter the giant that keeps whispering to you in the closet and in your car and seeing the bigger picture because even in the midst of winning the battles, no one has seen the lions and tigers and bears have prepared you for the giant you have ignored until this day and this time and this generation that you are to be victorious in. Somebody give me an amen. Okay, let's go on. I haven't said that in 19 years. I just thought I'd say that. <laughs> One more thing. Let me back up. You can say amen again. Let me, let me keep talking to you, you youngsters, like millennials and Xers and Zers and whatever letter of the alphabet you are. You have been raised by a generation that makes you think it's all about you. It ain't your fault. You've been raised that way. Okay? Now, I know you blame everybody for everything else. I just gave you somebody else to blame. So let me just tell you something. If you're going to follow Jesus, he's going to seclude you. And he's going to see if you'll trust him. Some of you have never been told no your entire life. Some of you have been told you're the center of God's universe your entire life. Some of you have been so spoiled and you're so rotten and some of you have made more money at the age of 35 than some people who have worked for 85 years and know you don't deserve it. And the reality is what you have found out is it has come up empty. That you do have the new Escalade and the new Austin Martin and you can drive anything and buy anything and you have an Austin Stone house. But what you haven't learned yet 
is how to kill the giants that still keep screaming to you in your car, in your closet, in your junk drawer every day. And I'm here to tell you, welcome the secluding hand of God to prepare you to change a legacy. Let's go on to, um, what are we, number seven? Are we number seven? Okay, number seven. Giant killers have learned to trust, now this one's, I'm gonna have to explain, have learned to trust their instincts more than opinions, practices, and traditions of those who choose to live with giants and stare at them. All right, now don't, don't shut down yet because I used some secular word called instincts. Okay, just stay with me. Let me give you three scriptures. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, that's in the New Testament. Just write one Thess, T-H-E-S. You can put another S on there if you want. So First Thessalonians 5.17 it says, in all things, be, be in prayer. Be praying all the time, which means you can't close your eyes all the time. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Just put Phil 4, 6, 7. And then Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Proverbs 3, 5, 6. Now, now here's what I mean by giant killers have learned to trust their instincts. I believe, and I'm telling you I believe because you can wrestle with it and test it and see if you're going to buy it. I believe one of the worst things we've done for people in the church is this consistent drumbeat of finding God's perfect will. I think it is crippling. And the reason I think it's crippling is because what it does is it turns people into a bunch of prayers who stop doing. And when you read through the scriptures, I love these stories, and I've told this story now so many times, and you can see it several times. I love 1 Samuel chapter 14. Just write it down and go back and read it. And then you can also read Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their story. And I'll tell them both. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, Saul's son David is off in one area of the country itching to fight. Because he sees the bigger picture and his, his warrior mentality has been forged in private in small battles. His dad, Saul, won't fight. And Jonathan is sitting here, it says, with his armor bearer. That's basically the, the dude who carries everything for him. And who would die for him? And Jonathan says to his armor bearer, hey, and I'm using today's language, but you can read it. Jonathan says, let's go pick a fight with the Philistines. And his armor bearer says, you go, I go. And so he says, he has a little conversation where he says, if they tell us to come up or if they tell us to stay down, and this is what he says in the middle of the conversation. He says to his armor bearer, if God is with us, we might win. I love that. I, I so totally love that. If God is for us, we win, which means what's the opposite of that? We die. Now, remember what Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, there's another story. Remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember that? Okay, just making sure. I was listening to this, this African-American pastor preach about this one time, and he called him Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. That was the funniest thing <laughs> I'd ever heard, ever and so I just, I just had to get that out. It's so good. And I couldn't say it first or I'd get in trouble. So anyways, this is when they're about to go into the fiery furnace. And this is what they say to the king. You know, you can do whatever you want. We're not going to bow the knee. And it just might be God might save us. You guys think that following God's will means everything works out the way you think it's supposed to work out. When the reality is, walking with God and sometimes slaughtering giants means you might get beat up and bloodied and done, and you might even die. And people would say, well, you must have missed God's will. Really? Really? I'm, listen, the instinct I'm talking about is you should be so walking in the Spirit you should be so attuned to God because of your time in the morning or the evening or your walk with him that as soon as you see a lion or a tiger or a bear in any form, did David walk up and say, give me a minute, I'm going to spend three days in prayer and fasting? Did he? The answer is no. He did not. He did not walk up and say, whoa, haven't seen this one Time to pray. No, no, no. He just said, I'm fighting. Now, why did he fight? He saw the bigger picture. He knew in his instincts. Now, think of instincts as this. He knew in his soul 
that was nurtured in quiet seclusion by the Spirit of God blowing up inside of him. He knew, I've got to fight this. And so many of you hear the voice of God screaming and shouting. And for 20 years, you've just been saying, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. I'm half convinced God quit listening. And he's saying to you, would you stop praying and start doing? I'm just this giant killer. You look throughout him. Caleb, when Caleb confronted Joshua about the land, he didn't walk up and he said, hey, I've been praying for 40 years. He said, hey, Josh, I've been waiting 45 years for this moment, man, and I need it because I'm as good now as I was then. I ain't as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. And that's a Toby Keith song, by the way. And he's like, I'm ready to roll. Let's go. Let's go. See, what, we are a bunch of waiters, and the Lord's calling out a bunch of warriors. That's a cool phrase right there, waiters and warriors. I didn't have it written down. So number eight. Let's go to number eight. This one's very sobering. Hang on, I gotta say something. I, I said this in the first service, and I don't want to leave it out. So here's, here's the part about warriors for Christ that affects every day. Okay, and and I noticed that in the recent, you know, everything around us is so politically partisan, it's ridiculous. And um and there's this dude on the radio. I won't tell you when he's on, okay? And it's not Rush. Um, and I'm listening to this dude on the radio, just ch- kind of channel surfing. And, um, and I, was, I caught the end of his broadcast. And I checked it a few days after that to see if he did, did this all the time. And at the end of his broadcast, this is what he said. And some of you might know who I'm talking about. You, I'm not getting on to you. I'm just listening to what I'm saying. At the end of his broadcast, he says, God bless Trump. Which I don't care if you like Trump or not. That's not the point. But I'd also heard this cat several years ago, and at the end of his broadcast, he never said, God bless President Obama. Now, I know I'm treading on thin ice here, but just hang on for just a minute. Last I remember, Jesus said the following words, love your enemies and do good to those who hurt you. For what good is it if you pray for your friends and bless your friends? Even the wicked people do that. Now, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I don't care if you're code pink, red, or blue. I I could care less this morning. But the reality is, as followers of Jesus, sometimes we're the loudest people and the most vitriolic people towards people we disagree with rather than showing love for people we disagree with and showing the grace of Jesus towards people we disagree with so the world can see us and say there's something different about that because of the quiet seclusion of God molding your heart. Now, I know some of you, I can feel you. Some of you are looking right at me with evil Republican eyes. I, I don't, that's whatever. And, and, and I'll be happy. I'm a registered Republican, so I'll tell you that. But you know what? I don't think when you get to heaven, God's going to say, red state, blue state. I need to know right now. I need to know. But I am convinced of this. I wonder how many of you in your day-to-day politics and even in your business, you have done it in such a way that over the last year, someone has stopped you who's not real sure of you and has said the following, I've been watching you and I've been listening to you and there's something different. Would you mind telling me? Because if not, well, number eight, post-victory giant killers are susceptible to the greater fall Some of you in this room are going to kill some giants. I believe it. You're going to change some trajectory. You're going to change some legacy. But the greatest giant killer of all, when he'd won the victory and set the nation free, it says in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I'll paraphrase it. You go back and read it. See that I'm not leading you astray. At the time when kings go out to war, David stayed home. And you know the rest of the story? He saw a woman bathing, and life changed. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, be careful that while you think you're winning, you just might, can you fill in the blank? Lose. Hebrews chapter 3 says, be on guard against the easy deception of sin that can creep in and cause you to stumble. Here's why. When you walk out of the valley holding the head of the giant that your family would never slaughter, but now you have, and you're the victor, the pride of victory creeps in rather than the humility of victory, and the enemy's got you. You are never in a place where you cannot trust, where you must be humble, is the place you must always be. Be careful. You're going to win. Some of you are going to win. And you're going to know what it's like. Some of you will win some battles over family legacies that you will weep when you realize the legacy has changed. But hear this voice reminding you that after a string of winning, he stood on a balcony when he should have been out fighting and life changed. Just because you win one battle doesn't mean you win the next. You follow me? We good? Last one. The giant killing movement just needs one victory. The giant killing movement just needs one victory. All it takes is one. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, after David kills Goliath, it says the Israelites all stood up and started chasing Philistines. Think about that. They all been sitting around and up walks this punk nosed kid who says, Man, I've been killing lions and tigers and bears. And then he kills the biggest one. And everybody who's been trembling and everybody who's been afraid and everybody who's been hiding, they go, oh, wait a minute. You mean we can win? Yes. People are waiting to see you win. They're waiting to see you win. So that they can know they can win. All it takes is one victory. All it takes is one. I hope and pray you're the one. Let's pray together. Thanks, Father, for our time together with Odessa and um, our North venue and here. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the giants. Um, I thank you for them. And I ask that you would raise up out of this room a generation of warriors who will change legacies, change destinies. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great afternoon, and hopefully you'll be here next week.